them that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has obligated upon them five obligatory I mean obligated upon them to pay zakat tu'khad min aghniyaihim that will be taken from the rich from amongst them wa turaddu ila fuqara'ihim and it will be returned it will be returned returned and given to the poor from amongst them and it's 2.5% of their wealth wa iyyakum i mean wa in ajabuka alad and if they accept that from you iyyakum wa qara'im amwalihim then beware of their valuable wealth meaning the wealth that they are in need of that they need to survive stay away from that only take the from the surplus that 2.5% and then the Prophet Sallallahu said, For in ajabuka ala thalika. And if they respond to that, Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam went on to tell Abu Musa Ashari, if they respond to that, for alimhum, then inform them, and Allah has farada alayhim al-siyam Ramadan, that Allah has obligated upon them the fast the month of Ramadan. And if they respond to you upon that, then inform them, and Allah has farada alayhim hajj. Bayt al Haram informed them that Allah has obligated them to make pilgrimage to the house if they have the financial capability and physical capability. So, this hadith the first thing the Messenger of Allah ordered him to teach the people was Tawheed. And then, after that, the Messenger of Allah, we know his messengership was 43 years. He spent, was 23 years, excuse me. His messengership was 23 years. 13, the first 13 of those years was in Mecca. And the last 10 of those years was in Medina. And he spent those 13 years calling to Tawheed. Teaching it, educating them, growing it in their hearts and in their lives. Allah didn't come with the obligation of... Of obligatory things, of zakah, of, sal- of the salah... Of the ahkam for laws and the various aspects of the religion to after they migrated to Medina, and all that was calling to Tawheed too. But we, the ulama, call that Mukammilat to Tawheed the thing that complete their Tawheed that will perfect the Tawheed. Why is that, brothers and sisters in Islam? Because Allah knows that He has He can going that He could made us of, of Ruhaniyya wa Hasasiyya, we comprise of spirituality. And we comprise of tangible things Hearing, seeing, tasting, and touching We comprise of these things These physical, tangible things Likewise, we are spiritual beings And have spirituality And what Tawheed is where the purity of the spirituality will come And when the legislation came with the things that will complete your Tawheed Which you by implementing the laws of Islam in your life that in and of itself is the completion of your Tawheed. That's why the, the Prophet started with Tawheed because it dealt with your heart, your creed, what that heart believed, what is settled in your heart and belief in Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. For that is important that we focus on that first as the Messenger of Allah did and then you still call to Tawheed when you teach in the other aspects of the deen you bring the benefits of Tawheed to the point you find the scholars follow the Messenger of Allah from that starting with the companions the first scholars up until this day the scholars of Sunnah the scholars of the Quran that they focus always and they gave no attention to teaching anything more than they taught Tawheed because that and correcting the belief systems and the creed of the people that's why aqid, the creed, is from the word aqd. And aqd comes from the word, it means to tie a knot. It means to make a knot. And when you make a tight knot, when a knot is tight, it's hard to, almost impossible to loosen it. This is what your belief is called. That you study your belief till it becomes so embedded in you, it's irremovable from you. And it illustrates itself on your limbs and your emotions and your loves and your hate and what you give for and what you hinder for. For once that has taken place, then that becomes your creed. And we all achieve a creed from our society and from our families. And so all of the messengers were sent to rectify the creed of the people. And you had to show them how to turn Allah to be the purpose behind all of their actions. So they single out Allah alone in their own actions. And this is why, by A, 
making their deeds be done sincerely for the sake of Allah be by it being in congruency with the sunnah of the messenger of Allah which both things require the acquisition of knowledge so Allah Ta'ala made this the call of all of the prophets and messengers every one of them from Nuh the first messenger of Allah to Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam the final messenger of Allah and it was over 1400 messengers or 23,000 messengers that were sent to mankind and prophets were sent to mankind and they all called to the same thing Tawheed first rectification of the creed that they have as Allah Ta'ala says لَقَدْ بَعَثْنَا فِي كُلِّ أُمَّةٍ رَسُولًا أَنِ اعْبُدُوا اللَّهَ وَجَتَنِبُوا الطَّاغُوتِ Verily we have sent to every nation a messenger saying to their people Worship Allah alone and stay away from false, de false deities And stay away from false deities For this was the da'wah of all the prophets and messengers And this shows the importance of calling to Tawheed And that is the origin and foundation of your religion If you solidify your belief Then the rest of your deen will be, will be strong that's why Allah Ta'ala in Surah Ibrahim gave the example of your aqidah, your creed, to the example of a goodly word. He called it a goodly word, which he then said is an example of a goodly tree. That its foundation is firm in the ground, and it grows because of that strong foundation, high roots into the sky and branches into the sky. Unending high tree with beautiful fruits coming from it. That's your deeds. That's your obedience. That's your servitude to Allah. Your tawheed will strengthen that. And the lack thereof strengthening tawheed will make that those deeds become weak. For tawheed, brothers and sisters in Islam, is what the messengers of Allah call to. As Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has taught us, we go, we call to tawheed to protect you from falling into that which will earn you the wrath of Allah. Tawheed shows you how to protect yourself from shirk, which is the opposite of Tawheed. Tawheed, you got to know its opposite, which is shirk. Associating partners with Allah, or we call polytheism. That Allah forbid it, it will destroy your deeds, invalidate them. Whereas Tawheed is so powerful, it will make all your deeds be accepted by Allah Ta'ala. This is why Allah Ta'ala said to his prophet, لَقَدْ أُوحِيَ إِلَيْكَ Verily we reveal to you Muhammad wa ladina min qablikum and to those who came before you meaning of the other prophets and messengers la in ashrakta that if you commit shirk Muhammad you Muhammad how much more those who was his followers that if you commit shirk la yahbatanna amaluk that truly your deeds will be null and void of no benefit wa la takunanna min al khasirin and you will be of the losers Bel, belillaha fa'bud wa kun min ash shakirin. And then Allah went on to say, Rather, worship Allah alone and be of those who show gratitude and gratefulness to Allah. That's what he told his messenger. So, of course, anyone who is of the followers of Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. So, the prophets and messengers, this was the focus of their da'wah, till he protected them from shirk. And gave them the ability to earn the contentment of Allah wa ta'ala And stay away from his wrath This is what Tawheed provides As Allah Ta'ala said to his messenger this reality over and over again in the Quran وَمَا أَرْسَلْنَا مِنْ قَبَلِكَ مِنْ رَسُولٍ Verily Muhammad we have not sent before you a messenger Except that we revealed to him That there is no deity worthy of worship except me So worship me alone This was the call of all the prophets And this has to be the call of all of, all of us And our deen, whatever we teach It got to be based off of this And then when we teach other aspects of fiqh We connect it to tawheed And show its connection Tawheed is never separated. That's why Ibn Qayyim al Jawziyah said, Al Quran kulluhu tawheed. That the Quran, all of it is a tawheed. It's either calling you to the sing how to sing, showing you how to sing out Allah alone for worship, or it's teach you the things that will complete your tawheed from the other aspects of the deen. This is why you find today you have many callers who never solidified their aqidah properly. So when they teach fiqh, they cause corruption. They mix it with corrupted call. 
and the people don't know it. So, Tawheed, brothers and sisters, it separates the right from what's wrong. This is why La ilaha illallah is comprised of negation and affirmation. A nephew and it's bad. To be a Muslim, you got to negate from Allah anything having the right of worship. And then you have to make isbat, a firm worship for Allah alone. La ilaha. There is no deity worthy of worship. Meaning anything or nothing has a right of worship. Illallah. Except Allah. Therefore, the rest of your Islam must be comprised of these two things. Affirming the truth and negate, negating what opposes the truth and affirming the truth. Practicing what you've been commanded and staying away from what you've been prohibited. The whole deen is like that. Even Muhammad al-Rasulullah. Bear witness that Muhammad is the messenger of Allah and the slave of Allah. In that is negating and affirming opposites. Because never is things properly understood except by knowing the opposite of that thing. As the Salaf used to say. Al-Ashya'u yufhamu min al That things are understood. It's a principle in a religion. Things are understood by its opposites. And that's a reality even in life. How you know water is cold? Because you know fire is hot. How you know the goodness of things of this life by experiencing adversity? These things make you appreciate the other and put them in their proper place. That's why the Salaf used to want to learn what evil was to avoid it. As Hudayfa ibn Yaman used to say, كان الناس يسألون رسول الله عن الخير that the people used to ask the messenger, Hudayf ibn Yaman, he said the people used to ask the messenger of Allah about the good. And I used to ask him, وَكُنْتُ أَسْأَلُهُ عَنِ الشَّرِّ I used to ask him about the evil. مَخَافَةً أَنْ يُدْرِكَنِي Fearing that it may reach me. So for this reason, the scholars have extracted a principle from this narration of Hudayf ibn Yaman. They said, one poem, poet said, عَرَفْتُ الشَّرَّ لَا لِلشَّرِّ that the Salaf used to say that I know evil not for the sake of just knowing evil but I know evil to avoid it for whoever does not know the good from the evil he will fall into that evil and this is the very reason why Umar ibn Khattab said Rahmatullahu ta'ala anhu he said Islam me That the bonds of Islam will be broken one after the other. Meaning, a bond here is referring to the establishment of ruling by the Book of Allah in the Sunnah of the Messenger of Allah in, the, in, a, in a country. The establishment, a bond is establishing the Adhan. A bond is establishing the five prayers in the Masjid. A bond is establishing the Jum'ah. A bond of Islam is establishing the... Establishing the um, the AIDS celebrations Like this And all of the symbols and pillars of Islam The rights of Hajj is a bond The Umar ibn al-Khattab said They will be broken one after the other Meaning they will be abandoned by the Muslims They will be destroyed and broken one after the other And, and in one narration It was mentioned That the first one will be ruling by the book of Allah That will be the first one to be broken by the Muslims They won't rule over They will take democracy Republic Rulership um, and all of those other different things that's out there to rule other than what Allah has legislated. So Umar ibn al-Khattab said the bonds of Islam will be broken one after the other. And then he explained why. إِذَا نَشَأَ فِي الْإِسْلَامِ مَنْ لَمْ يَعْرِفِ الْجَاهِلِيَّةِ When there appears in the Muslims, those who raised amongst the Muslims, who don't understand what ignorance is. And ignorant ways. And ignorant idealisms. Why? Because those Muslims, when they're invited to those ignorant things, they will accept them with warmth because they don't know that they're evil. What do we say the poet said? I don't know evil for the sake of knowing evil. I know evil to avoid it. For whoever doesn't know evil, the good from the evil will fall into it. For this is why Tawheed must be taught. It solidifies your belief system. It solidifies your establishment From the benefits of it, Tawheed From the things we benefit from it, Tawheed Is that learning Tawheed Enables you to do a little bit of deeds And get tremendous rewards for them 
You can do a little deed And Allah give tremendous reward for it And some tremendous status And blessings for it in the worldly life Whereas if you commit shirk You can do an abundancy of deeds And none of them be accepted by Allah As we mentioned earlier Allah said what to his prophet in ashrakta That if you was to commit shirk Muhammad La yahbatanna amaluk we would have invalidated, would, your deeds would truly be invalidated. And truly you would be from the losers. So if this is the case, Tawheed protects you. Tawheed provides for you to do a very little deeds and get great reward. From the virtues of it, Tawheed in the life of the believer is that Tawheed, it causes an individual to be in always the state of repenting and returning back to Allah. When they do wrong When they slip up They don't get stuck on some sin They don't get stuck on some stupidity They don't get stuck on disobedience Because they learned who Allah is Through Tawheed, His commandments His prohibitions His names and attributes How He deal with His creation How He rewards them How He punishes them How Allah deals with His creation what, What's the difference between How Allah deal with the believers From how He deal with disbelievers you learn these things, so in learning that, enable you to know how to deal when you fall wrong. You slip up. Tawheed provides that for you. This is why when a person engulfs himself in other than Tawheed, what we cuss why the scholars call Tawheed and Aqidah, Usul al Deen, the foundations of the religion, to this point, even in the universities. They call the science of Usul al Deen, the fundamentals of the Deen, they're referring to your belief. And learning the sciences of Islam, they call that the furu'a, the branched off matters. It's less important. It must be first your foundation, your belief, your creed. And then you learn the fiqh and the other aspects of the religion. But if you proceed one without the other, then your fiqh will become corrupted. Because you don't know how to avoid the evil, the opposite of that. This is what Aqidah of the Salaf provides, brothers and sisters in Islam. And it's incumbent upon us that we strive hard and give more attention to studying Tawheed than any aspect of the deen. You have people today that go teach seerah of the prophet, which is all good. They go teach akhlaq, character. They like to talk about tafsir, of the, uh, they have to talk about the Quran and just the explanations and the stories in the Quran. They like to talk about fiqh, which are all good things. And they take Tawheed and empty their masters from teaching it to the people. And so you'll find a person, his fiqh will be tight, but he corrupted in his belief system. Which caused his deeds to either be nullified or decreased in their reward. Because he didn't solidify the tawheed. Of the virtues of a tawheed is that it causes people who do the same deed at the same time, that their reward will be different in their grandeur or their um, decadence. Based upon how firm the t- belief in Allah and his messenger is in their heart. The more firmer that belief is, the more your reward is for your deeds. So that's why we could get up right now and do the make salat together. None of us get the same reward. It varies based upon how firm your belief system. So Tawheed provides that reality. The virtues of a Tawheed, it makes you understand when you go through severe disaster or adversity in life. Tawheed makes you be patient and accept it with open arms. Because Tawheed teaches you Allah is Al-Mudabbir He is the arranger of affairs And that he don't arrange something to be decreed for you For your, your detriment But for your advancement To increase your earnings of rewards and forgiveness Because when you carry the burden of diff- adversities in life Knowing Allah only gave this to you to wipe away your sins That Allah gave you this so you can return back to Allah more And evaluate your own shortcomings And repent to Allah for us it becomes good As some of the Salaf used to say I used to wait for the difficult decrees of Allah So I can get reward Or the example of the woman who got her hand cut off She lost her hand or her arm And she was seen as soon as it happened Her thanking Allah and grateful And so the people around her said What are you doing? How can you be thanking Allah for losing your arm? She said the reward I'm going to get for being patient Make me forget what I have lost And that Allah has left me what? Another arm, he didn't take my other arm, make me be grateful. And that's the other virtue of Tawheed. Tawheed, you add the ila tafa'ul. Tawheed leads to optimism in everything. You don't look at the glasses half and full. 
you look or half empty with like a glass of water, as the old adage go, you know, you got a half a glass of water. Negative thinking make you say, oh man, I only got a half a glass of water. Positive, optimistic thinking say, mashallah, I got a half a glass of water. I could have possibly not have no water. So you look at the optimistic aspects of things, which help you deal with hardship. So Tawheed decreases, it removes hardship or it decreases the burden of hardships upon the heart. Because Tawheed and learning your belief in Qadr and Qadr and what Allah predestined and how he executed makes you accept it because you know Allah don't burden a soul beyond his capability. And what was meant to happen to you will not pass you by. And what has passed you by was never meant to reach you so you won't over grieve. For Tawheed is the thing that provides these tremendous affairs. And so from there, we move on to the life of our beloved Imam, our Faqih, Muhammad, Abu Muhammad, Abdullah, Ibn Abi Zayd, Abdul Rahman, Al Nafzi, Al Qayrawani, Al Maliki, Rahimahullah Ta'ala. That we want to talk about. This great Imam's life, Rahimahullah, for the next short minutes before Maghrib comes in. And this Imam, as we already have given you his name, this man was born the year 310 Hijra on a on a migrate on the um, lunar calendar, and the lunar calendar was established when the Prophet migrated from Mecca and Medina. That was the beginning of the first year. That's why we now in the 1440 year. Of the Hijra lunar calendar For this sheikh was born 310 In the city of Piedrawan Rahimahullah And the sheikh Hafizahullah Or Rahimahullah Ta'ala He Was a man that was an imam Of this religion Who died the year 389 Hijra He died You must write this down The year 389 years 389 Hijra So how old was he? If he was born 310 and died 389 Take 10 from 89 How old was he? He was 79 Rahimahullah Ta'ala So this was He accomplished great things in that 79 years He was born Rahimahullah In Tunis In the city of al Qayrawan. And when he was born in that city, he was raised up in a, as is from a small child, in the house of knowledge. And he had achieved great lofty things in the dunya. He achieved much wealth in the dunya. And he achieved high status in the deen. To the point, Al-Qadi Iyad, Rahimahullah. He said a tremendous statement about him. Qadi Iyad said in his book Tartib al Madarik, he said Abu Muhammad, meaning Abu Zayd al Ibn Abi Zayd al Qirawani, he said Abu Muhammad in Haz al Riyasat al Dunya wa al Deen, wa intafa'a bihi khalqun kathirun fil ilmi wa al akhlaq. He said about Abu Muhammad. Al Qirawani, Qirawani. He said, This man Abu Muhammad had obtained leadership in the deen and in the dunya in the worldly life and in the deen. And an abundancy of cre of mankind had benefited from him in knowledge and in character. In knowledge and in character. Pause right there. We want to bring a fat either, a benefit. Number one, brothers and sisters in Islam, this is the goal. In sitting in the knowledge The circles of the people of knowledge And the student of knowledge Is that you come to learn character and knowledge from them As Imam Abu Dawood The Sajistani The famous author of Sunan Abi Dawood Who was the student of Imam Malik He said Rahimahullah He said thousands used to come to the circles of Imam Ahmed Thousands But only a few of them were students of knowledge The majority was common people Coming to learn character and knowledge so Al Qadi Iyad, this is what he said. And we understand that the Shaykh traveled and became an Imam in the Madhab of Imam Malik. Rather, he became of the few people who preserved the Madhab of Imam Ahmed. I mean Imam Malik. And it's Imam Malik. 
And he achieved great things in knowledge. And he studied with the major scholars of Kairawan, of his own town, which is another benefit that we tend to lose. We will get on a plane or go to another country to seek knowledge from its scholars. And we didn't even get knowledge from the people of knowledge in our own countries. And that's the origin of knowledge. You learn from where you are if there are people who have knowledge. Then you travel when you want greater knowledge to other people, to other others, to people of the other people of knowledge. For Abu, uh, for Imam Abu Muhammad Ibn Abi Zayd al Qayrawani, he studied with the major scholars of his time in al Qayrawan in that city, and he achieved greatness and knowledge in early age because he started as a young man. To such extent, this book that we are going through. He wrote it at the age of 17. He was 17 years old. He was a scholar at that age, began to author at that age, which shows his high ambition for knowledge and his concern with bringing the ummah back to the obedience of Allah and distancing them from the wrath of Allah in their lives. So here, this shows he reached high intelligence and ma high maturity at such a young age. He had an expansive amount of knowledge and he was known for his abundant ability to bring narrations from the Qur'an and from the Sunnah of the Prophet Sallallahu and know the meanings and understanding of them. Rahimahullah, he became a person who was a true follower of Minhaj as Salaf as Salih, following the methodology of our righteous pre predecessors, meaning the Prophet and his companions and the, three gen the two generations after them. He, he followed that and didn't Leave it off not even for the small amount of the size of a fingernail Everything of his life he conditioned With the, with the methodology of the righteous predecessors He didn't pick and choose what he wanted to, to follow So for that reason you find That this man held firm to the methodology of the Salaf Bin lisani wal qalami wal amal with his, on his, whatever he said off his tongue Never opposed the way of our righteous predecessors in His writings and his books Was in accordance to the methodology Of the righteous predecessors And his actions and application Was according to that same methodology And this bit we benefit from hearing this Is that the people you take knowledge from You want them to have these qualities You don't want to take knowledge from someone Who may be on a sunnah and they fiqh And they are stray and they are aqidah they are strong on this area, but they oppose the sunnah in another area. These people we should stay away from because if their creed, this is because their creed has become tainted. And if their creed tainted, then the rest of their deen is going to have taint in it. And now you are putting yourself in harm's way, not having the knowledge he has or she has. And you sit with this person knowing they got corruption in their belief. And you don't know what you may hear as Abu, as, um, Abu Ayyub as Sakhtiani said. When a man came to him to take a narration from him, I want to debate with him about an ayah, a, a chapter of the Quran. He said, you can't debate with me about an ayah. Not that one verse. Get away from me. And he was real harsh and sent this man away. Because he was calling to that which opposed the book and the sunnah. He wanted to debate with him about it. So the students that was around him, Abu Ayyub said, why was you so harsh to that man like that? He said, wallahi, Allah created the heart weak. And I feared if I listen to his speech, he may say something that may seep into my heart. And only Allah knows when it may leave. And that's the nature of innovation, brothers and sisters in Islam. That innovation, the prophet compared it to the disease of rabies. If you get rabies bitten by a dog and have the disease of rabies and you go. If you have to rush to go get your shots to get it removed. Because if you let it sit, it spread through all the joints of your body. And it's almost impossible to get it out there. If not impossible Likewise is innovation Because innovation is essence The people who hear it They believe that which is opposite of the religion Is the religion And that which is the opposite of that thing Which is the sunnah Is innovation So in their mind they think the wrong way is the right way And when they see which is opposite of it Which is the right way They say that's the wrong way And the messenger of Allah said it will get to the point that people will say They will see sunnah and say that's bid'ah That's innovation, that's innovation And when they see innovation they will say that's the sunnah And boy for no doubt We live in that today And this is why we protect our hearts By trying to limit ourselves to only taking Knowledge from those who are upon sunnah And only a time Taken from those who's not upon the Aqidah of the salaf and the minhaj of the salaf 
is when we have nobody else but this person to teach that area of the religion. Like that. And the Shaykh, Rahimahullah, he was a, so powerful in knowledge that he became a person who was a sign of understanding and fiqh of the religion during his time. And we already mentioned what Qadi al Iyad has said about him. He was a person who was very concerned and high ambitious about the, to preserve the madhab of Imam Malik. To such an extent, Qarrabahu ila nas. That he was able to make it become beloved and close to the hearts of the people in Morocco and in his area where he was from. To this day, Tunis and Morocco are still upon the Maliki method. And this man lived over a thousand years ago. And this is because. We only have in, pres in preservation four methods. The method in the proper order of Abu Hanifa, and then the method of Imam Malik, then the method of Imam Shafi'i, and then the method of Ahmed ibn Hanbal. But there were other methods. Method is uh, the, the scholars, what they taught through their lifetime, and what they, our creed and their fiqh was, and how they worshiped Allah, and what they taught in legal verdicts of the religion. That's a method, that's the doctrine of a scholar. Many scholars had doctrines. But these are the only ones that was preserved in totality. Why? Because of their students. Any scholars who doctrine that didn't get preserved is because he didn't have enough students that, def that pushed his way and pushed what he was upon his knowledge. This is why one of the rights of the scholars over their first right of the scholar over their student is that they teach and spread and represent their knowledge and spread the knowledge of their sheikh. And this was the methodology of our righteous predecessors. If an Imam Malik's methodology was preserved because he had only a few scholars that pushed his methodology. As we find, it was mentioned by the ulama. They say, Lawla Shaykhani wa Muhammadani wa Qadiani la da'a madhabul Malik. That they said, if it wasn't for the two sheikhs, two scholars, and the two Muhammads, and the two scholars with the name Qadi, truly the doctrine or methodology or madhab of Imam Malik would have been lost if it wasn't for them six scholars. And who are they? The two Shaykhani, the two scholars were the, the author of the book we're teaching today. Ibn Abi Zayd, Abu Bakr. I mean, Ib, 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 one of them was, was um, the two Shaykhs was the Shaykh we mentioned, Abu Muhammad. Ibn Abi Zayd al Qayrawani, and the second Shaykh was Ibn Abi Zayd Abu Bakr al Azhari, who was also a great scholar of the Maliki Madhab. He preserved it. The two Muhammads that the scholars say are Muhammad ibn Suhnun al Tanuhi, who was from Tunis also. And the second Muhammad was Muhammad ibn Muwaz. For these two scholars preserved the method, the doctrine, the method of Imam Malik. Number three, the, the, the other next two scholars or two Qadiani, two scholars with the name Qadi, was Qadi Abdul Wahab al Baghdadi. He preserved the doctrine, the madhab of Imam Malik, and also Qadi Abu Hassan. These two scholars, or Qadiani, with the name Qadi, but during these six scholars, if it wasn't for them, the doctrine, the madhab of Imam Malik would have been lost, but it was preserved. And the sheikh who we're teaching today was from the amongst them. And he gave tremendous, this shows the importance of the tremendous concern that the student, whoever we take knowledge from, that we convey the knowledge that we learn from them. And that's how you preserve the knowledge of that sheikh or that student, like this. And so that the Sadaqatun Jariya can continue, the ongoing charity and beneficial knowledge can continue. And Imam Abu Muhammad al Qayrawani. He spread the knowledge of Imam, uh, Imam Malik. And that one of the reasons why he became so well known, he had one of the highest chains to Imam Malik, meaning the shortest chain. It wasn't a lot of scholars between him and Imam Malik from the sheikhs that he took from. One sheikh he took from who taught him the Mal Maliki method between him and Imam Malik was two scholars. And the other scholar between him and Imam Malik, Sheikh Abu Zayd al Kirwani, was three scholars. So he only had that short link. So because of that, he became a well-known scholar of the madhab of Imam Malik. And he became known for pushing um, 
he became so known for that they call him Al Malik Imam Malik is Sagir. They call him the little Imam Malik because of how well he preserved and pushed and brought it near to the hearts of the believers in the area where he came from. So it is important for us to understand this. And he wrote many books. One of them, we're going to mention two books of his that was tremendous. One of his two books is a book he wrote, this treatise we're going through, of course. And the book he wrote called An Nawadir wa Ziyadat ala ma fil muwatta min min ghayriha min al ummahat min masail al malik wa ashabi in his five volumes he wrote a book basically translated rare narrations and extra narrations that is more than what you'll find in Imam Malik's book called the Muwatta and other than that that which is in the other not from the other six books of hadith Okay, and the issues that Imam Malik brought that you won't find in his Mawatha, his companions, meaning his students. So he brought things about Imam Malik's doctrine that wasn't just in his famous book called the Mawatha, which was the first book written on fiqh. The first fiqh book written was Imam Malik's book, and it was considered the most authentic book before Bukhari because it came before Bukhari. And then Bukhari, when it came, it became the most authentic book, not because it was more authentic, but because Imam Bukhari relied on more narrations from the Prophet and the Quran. Whereas Imam Malik, he mentions a lot of the customs of the people of Medina because they were close to the Prophet. So that's the only reason why Bukhari is more authentic. Not that they got more authentic narrations than Imam Malik's book. But just the fact they got more narrations from the Prophet than Imam Malik's book. Imam Malik relied more on the scholars of Medina. And, and, and of course narrations from the Prophet So this book was tremendous And the other book was the Mukhtasar uh, He called Mukhtasar al-Mudawwana Which this book had mentioned 50 different issues of the deen That's very important That you some of them issues you won't find Except in that book In areas of fiqh So this shows the tremendousness of Imam Who had wrote this book This treatise And when he died in the year 379 Hijrah that when he died That It was interesting One day he was seen In the masjid in deep thought Mustagrik fil fikr He was in deep thought To such an extent That they came to him Someone who saw him what's, what's wrong He said I had a dream That my door was, Had fallen in front of me The front door of his house And an interpreter of dreams Told him that that's a sign of your death And within a few days thereafter He had died Rahimahullahu ta'ala For this was the life Of the sheikh And this is the scholar who we're taking from Who was known for his righteousness He was known for his patience In dealing with the creation He was known for his strongness In practicing the sunnah Of Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam And teaching it and carrying the righteous character and noble character and carrying the harm that came from the people and being patient and conveying knowledge. For this is the goal and objective of all of us when it comes to knowledge. And with that, inshallah, we come to an end. And we wanted to say before one minute, before we call the Adhan, is that the questions we're going to ask for you in the next class is we're going to ask what is the importance of a tawheed, number one. What is the importance of Tawheed? And you can bring some of the points we brought. You can, if you didn't take good notes, you can go to my YouTube page and listen to the lecture and take notes. Second question we will ask you is, what is the benefits of a Tawheed? Bring me some of the benefits that we mentioned. And next we will know, the third question we will ask is, why... Or who was Abu Zayd? What year was Abu Zayd al-Kirwani born? Ibn Abu Zayd al-Kirwani when he was born and what year did he die? And what was his status in Islam and with the people of his time in scholasticism? We're going to ask these questions, inshallah ta'ala. And with that, we come to an end. And we're going to ask you to bring some benefits that we could take from, this, from the life of Abu Zayd al-Kirwani. These will be the questions we will ask you in the next class and next Sunday, inshallah ta'ala. And of course, we have passed out the paperwork of the next class that we will cover, inshallah ta'ala. And in that next class, I translated the portion in the beginning of the metan of Abu Zayd al-Kirwani, the text 
of Abu Zayd al Kirwan, and we put some Arabic terminologies and some verse, Arabic verses in there. And inshallah ta'ala, we will, with the permission of Allah, we will cover five elements that is in that. We will cover five elements that is in that. And those five elements that we will cover, uh, brothers and sisters in Islam, I'm going to give them to you now, is our... We will cover, number one, the Tawheed of Allah in His Lordship, Rububiyyah, and in His Uluhiyyah, and in His Worship, and in His Asma, we'll see that in His names and attributes. That's the first thing, the first element we will cover, one of the elements we will cover. Secondly, we will cover the importance of freeing Allah from human qualities of having children, having parents, and having a spouse. Or having a mate. That's number two. We will free Allah. We will talk about how we're supposed to free Allah of children and parents and having a mate. Number three, we will talk about negating of partners and associates away from Allah. Negating that away from Allah. And we will talk about number four. Again, I repeat number three. Um, negating equals and partners from Allah Ta'ala from what we gave you today um, of the, from the paperwork and number four we will cover the prohibition of pondering and reflecting over the realities of Allah's names and attributes or the self of Allah and his attributes the prohibition of pondering and reflecting over the reality what is the true reality of Allah's self and his attributes and fifthly, we will cover Al-Hathu ala tadabbur wal itti'ad wal i'tibari bi ayatillah We will talk about the importance of encouraging Or we will cover the encouragement of reflecting And taking admonition and lessons from the verses of the Qur'an That we're going to find in the, the little stuff that we cover So this is the points we're going to cover And obviously they're going to be the questions in the third class Inshallah ta'ala and again, we encourage the people to stay consistent in coming out because this class, for those who have the best attendance, inshallah ta'ala, we will have gifts for them at the end of the class. And at the end of the class, you complete the class, we will have a dinner for the students who came for the class and a test will be ensued for whoever passed that test. We'll give a certificate for qualifying them to saying that they know this book and they qualify they have the right to teach this book inshallah ta'ala this text inshallah ta'ala and if you don't know arabic you have to we were, we were part of that test is trying to memorize the text of the book in english inshallah ta'ala or know it like you memorize it and those who know arabic to memorize the arabic text of the book which will be encouraged but we will take it by portion inshallah ta'ala we will take it in portions and when we start our brother amin or Hafidhullah, he will read the text of the book in Arabic and in English. And we will talk about that and get you to repeat it so you have that on the tape for practice's purpose for those who want to memorize it, English or Arabic. And then we will go into the explanation of the portion we cover. And again, this, will, this course will be complete in 13, 12 to 13 classes. And each class you'll get, every time we come to class, you will get your new portion of what we're going to cover for that day. Inshallah ta'ala, okay? May Allah bless and reward us. So what we cover in the day will be in the next class. And I will pass out the paper so it's going to be in the next class after that. Okay? So this is what we do. So please, brothers, the aqidah, the creed of the believers is, is very important. We come out of benefit. And after this, our brother, uh, Abdul Karim, Hafidhullah, he will be teaching the book, al shama al Muhammadiyah, the characteristics of Muhammad, his qualities and attributes. Stay in benefit from that between Maghrib and Isha. هذا وصلى الله وسلم وبارك على نبينا محمد وعلى آله وصحبه أجمعين وآخر دعوانا أن الحمد لله رب العالمين. If there any questions, to follow after that then. What's your question? Allahu Akbar. Allahu Akbar. Allahu Akbar. Allahu Akbar. أشهد أن لا إله إلا الله أشهد أن لا إله إلا الله أشهد أن محمد
محمد رسول الله أشهد أن محمد رسول الله حي على الصلاة حي على الصلاة